part that you played in the introduction of the doctrine of Methemsicosis among the Greeks. On a religious level, where his emphasis upon the unity of world religion, his vast traveling has brought him into direct contact with the great religious systems of his time. And the mystical disciplines which were practiced in the university which he established at Crotona. Thus we have a man whose achievements uh, cover an unusually broad range. And as a result, his memory has passed through many vicissitudes in the descent of time. <coughs> Those who admire his scientific achievements are inclined to question his philosophical attainments or to doubt his religious opinions. Yet all in all, a grateful world has honored him, and perhaps through a better understanding of his philosophy, uh, some of the doubts and uncertainties concerning his various contributions uh, can be brought into focus, clarified, and something added in this century to the luster which already around his illustrious name. Our discussions in these talks will be principally with the mathematical philosophy of Pythagoras, which also divides into two essential parts, one of which may be termed theoretical and the other practical. On the practical level, Pythagoras made the greatest contribution of the ancient world to the advancement of the science of mathematics. He is responsible for the later achievements of Euclid, who in turn has influenced all mathematical thinkers down to the present day. If it had not been for Pythagoras and Euclid, there might not have been a sign met or an Einstein. The great development of mathematics rested, therefore, upon the practical findings of Pythagoras and the philosophy of number upon his philosophical speculations. Pythagoras was one of the first, if not the first, to emphasize the importance of number and mathematics in the advancement of the total state of man's integration. He was loath to assume that so noble a science, so magnificent a system, was devised simply uh, for the convenience of the banker and the money changer. The purpose of mathematics was to unfold the orderly instruments, man's internal consciousness of the universe around him and the psychic life within him. Thus to Pythagoras, mathematics was part of religion, part of philosophy, part of all those great ideals, the great systems of human thought, which have enriched and cultured, cultivated and civilized the conduct of human beings. This evening we are going to discuss, first of all, the Pythagorean concept of numeration and number. And in this, we come to the theoretical phase of the master's work. We are interested in this phase because certainly it is possible to progress from the science of mathematics for a practical purpose by attending many schools or by a moderate study of mathematical textbooks. For the most part, however, progression of this kind does not include the philosophy of number or the great imponderables relating to the universal mystery, which Pythagoras regarded as the essence and substance of all mathematical speculation. Thus we must understand not only something of the numbers as taught by Pythagoras, but something of the philosophy which he interpreted through number, and which has become identical with the numerical speculation 
for the majority of those who have studied his system. To begin with, then, Pythagoras recognized the existence of a primary and basic concept in mathematics, which he called archetypal number. Archetypal number, as the term itself indicates, is a concept of numeration which exists in the divine mind. As archetypes are patterns or designs, uh, which when impressed upon substances result in the gradual unfoldment of orderly sequences. So archetypal number represents the key to the great design of being. It represents and unfolds the entire theory of existence and enables the individual through the study of archetypal number to apprehend or apperceive the basic function of the divine mind. Thus, to Pythagoras, numeration was a kind of mathematics existing only in the consciousness of God. And mathematics themselves, the various branches of arithmetical science, these branches represent these archetypal or divine numbers shadowed forth into the mundane world and becoming the guiding, the guiding principle, the controlling design affecting the unfoldment, growth, evolution, and progress of every living thing. Thus he distinguished what he called numeration, which is a descent of number in principle. And he also represented or recognized numbers themselves, which in their turn were a descent of numeration on the objective level of numerical division. Thus, if we approach the concept of numeration, we must approach the basic definition of deity as understood in the Pythagorean system. What is numeration, and how does it differ from number? Numeration is number in principio. <coughs> Numeration is a concept of number, but is not number itself. When we say God is one, we are really thinking in terms of numeration. One, in this case, is a con concept of totality, not a concept of unit or a concept of first, or a concept of an isolated numerical one. When we say that the end of human experience is union with the divine, we are thinking now of a concept of union based upon the concept of unity, and unity is again a numerational concept of oneness. Yet unity is not one. You wouldn't say two plus unity equals three. You wouldn't think that way. Unity has a different connotation. Unity is one, but it is a totality. Unity is one in the term of the annihilation of interval. Because things which are in a state of unity are in a state of identity a state of sameness, or a state of assimilation by which all division or separateness between them can no longer be conceived or calculated. Therefore, unity is the restoration of all division, the reestablishment of totality as a concept. Man himself has never seen totality because regardless of what he may see, the unseen must also be conceived as existing, and totality must be the complete unity of the seen and the unseen. It must be the complete identity of the known and the unknown. 
Therefore man may not perceive it, but man may conceive it. Yet even in his conception thereof, there is a limitation, and his conception is empiric. That is, it is an assumption based upon the acceptance of the concept or the statement that the known plus the unknown equals one. Now this is a concept that carries us into one of the deepest abstractions of thought, and we find it restored to us in a great school of Indian thought, the school of yoga. Yoga means union. It means the state or consciousness of oneness. Now oneness in the search of by man for the nature of truth assumes this condition of an at one meant. It is the concept of an ultimate state achieved by a progressive annihilation of diversity or interval by which gradually the human being achieves a state of identity with total existence. All these things are words, but words in turn are symbols of ideas. Ideas are in man the shadows of archetypes, because according to these concepts, the universe, creation itself, existence, manifested being, are all suspended from eternal ideas in the divine mind. Man attempting to understand God and himself uh, engenders within his own intellect shadowy ideas which are archetypal but not complete, but which do indicate to a limited degree the probable direction of the divine mind. Numeration, then, differs from number inasmuch as it represents in every instance either unity itself or aggregations of the parts of unity no longer arranged side by side, but conceived as a new unity composed of divided parts. Let us then assume that we have in our hand a number of straws. And we will say that we count these straws and we find that we have twelve. Now this immediately creates the possibility of two concepts of the nature of twelve. One of these concepts is that we are holding in our hands twelve separate straws. Therefore we can conceive of twelve as a symbol to represent a dozen of anything. Twelve matches, twelve dollars, twelve straws. These are, a, these are a group or a specified number of these items. And twelve things may not all be alike. We may hold twelve objects all of different categories, and call them also twelve, unless we wish to distinguish in greater detail by saying that four of these objects are lemons, two are oranges, and six are apples. Thus we have ways of distinguishing types within number, but we are dealing with twelve things. Now there is another way of conceiving of this. Because when twelve objects are brought together, they produce a grouping for which a single term is applicable. When we hold out twelve objects in our hands, we don't point at them and say one, 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 so many times. We say twelve. 
And at the moment we say 12, a numerical concept arises in the consciousness of the person we address. And we transfer the concept of this group as a collective. And we know that the number 12 is capable of stimulating an idea. And that this idea is not, com is not 12 separate parts, primarily but is a unit called 12. That this unit has a nature of its own, dimensions, boundaries, proportions, and is applicable only to a certain order or numer numerical group. If we remove one of these straws, the total number, the total number 12 is destroyed and a new number is created, and that number is 11. And 11 is also a unit, a oneness, a totality, composed of the 11 separate parts. Therefore, all groups may be considered as composed of separate parts, or may be considered as units, or unities composed of a certain number of related elements or members. Thus, 12 is a numeration. 12 ones, considered separately, constitute numbers. The 12 is an idea which conveys to us oneness composed of 12 parts whereas the parts themselves do not convey oneness, nor necessarily imply it, for they may be separate when so considered, but when grouped, they engender a new idea, which is the sum of themselves. Now, Pythagoras made a great point of this on a philosophical level. It might not seem to be important at the beginning, but I think you will see how it gains importance as we proceed. So we begin now with the first of the Pythagorean mathematical concepts, which may be called unity or the monad. Now, unity is a term applicable to God. And therefore, the Pythagoreans did not properly regard it as a number. They considered it the first motion of being and the first expression of the universal consciousness. For the first conceivable or apperceivable quality of the divine nature is unity. Now, unity in this case is a single term covering what we term the phenomenon of ultimate and absolute diversity. We think of deity as being the total of all its parts, the complete essence of creation. And we think of God as that immense and incalculable being in whom we live and move and have our existence. Therefore, actually, the complete unit, the complete monad, the one which is all. Now, the one which is all may likewise be conceived of geometrically as a sphere for the reason that a sphere is a geometrical solid with an infinite number of surfaces. In other words, the assumption is that there is an inconceivable number of flat planes in the structure of a circle, and that this circle, therefore, is unlimited or eternal in its surfacing and also the sphere rests upon the least hypothetical 
service of its own nature. The sphere of all geometrical forms rests upon the least part of itself and also is the most immediately subjected to motion. And the sphere moves wherever the surface upon which it is placed is in any way unbalanced. This is again a Pythagorean theorem, because to the Pythagoreans the first motion of being is due to the uneven nature of eternal surface upon which the sphere operates or moves. And you can see how these different principles become involved in a variety of ideas. Now Pythagoras, beginning with the numeration of the monad or of the unit, began in this way to philosophize. What is there in nature that is outside of or beyond the nature of infinite being? Pythagoras defined God as an infinite being whose body was composed of the substance of light and whose soul was composed of the substance of truth. This definition perhaps is one of the noblest and uh, the most splendid that we have in philosophical history. Conceiving deity to be infinite, and to conceive that there could be no interval in the nature of deity, no restriction upon the infinite manifestation of infinite being. Pythagoras, conceiving the deity and the monad, or the unit, to be similar or identical, or at least in proximity, proximity to each other theoretically, came to the conclusion that the one, or the monad, the unit, the totality, is the only numeration that can exist per se, without qualification, limitation, or restriction. It is also the only immortal number, the only eternal numeration, inasmuch as it is the only thing which cannot be destroyed. Totality is indestructible, inasmuch as all destruction, so-called, is the reduction of part within totality. In other words, any creature can die and its body can be returned to the various elements from which it came. And the soul may return to the sidereal powers from which it came. But this, this, this destruction or disintegration of body is merely the, death, the dissolving of a compound. Nothing is lost. Everything remains in the universe. All forms are subject to change, but nothing is destructible in the sense of being uh, susceptible of annihilation. The only thing which is not subject to change and therefore subject to what we call destruction is totality, inasmuch as there can never be less than all, there can never be more than all, Nothing can be added to all, and nothing can be taken from all. All cannot be multiplied, nor can it be divided, or in any way qualified. Thus allness, or the state of totality, is a term to be given at all times to the sum of all conceivable and inconceivable parts. And these parts, regardless of their number, regardless of their multiplication, regardless of infinite generation infinitely diversifying them in time and space, whenever you put the parts together, the term all is suitable. Whether this all is made of three parts or of three million parts, 
The sum of parts is always all. Therefore, we have a conceptual allness. Now, allness being monad or unity, and not being susceptible of division, because to divide God is to destroy God. To divide unity, theoretically, is to annihilate it or destroy it. And as it is by nature indestructible, it cannot be divided. And consequently, it is impossible for totality to ever exceed unity, or unity to ever exceed totality. Now this may, may not seem to be leading anywhere in particular, except into deep water. But it is leading somewhere, as we'll try to point out. <coughs> because we are coming now to one of the most difficult and tricky problems with which uh, thinkers have been confronted since the dawn of time. Unity or totality existing forever and eternally in its own nature is said to rest or to be without the quality of motion. For where can the all move? Being all, it cannot move from place to place because all is within place and place with, is within all and they are identical. All can neither increase nor decrease in totality. It can neither divide nor subtract, nor can it at any time be less than itself, nor can it at any time generate creatures inferior to itself, nor can it at any time create a creature or a being which has an interval between itself and totality. Those are the qualities and attributes of totality itself. We could never travel so far into space that we could get beyond the circumference of being. Therefore, we can never depart from it, nor can we ever approach it more intimately, because its center is everywhere. Thus, the concept of unity, or of the monad, the more we study it and the more we analyze it, enlarges our entire appreciation of the nature of God by projecting this appreciation onto a mathematical scale or level and achieving more and more, by thoughtfulness, extraordinary penetration into the theory of pure number. Yet Pythagoras and everyone else was well aware of the fact that from this immense and immeasurable source, from this indivisible root and cause, the phenomena of apparent diversity emanated, and numeration set in motion became number. And number in its own motion produced the numerals all the numerations, which were the Pythagorean symbols for the infinite diversity of life. What then is the answer? And Pythagoras pointed out, since diversity must exist, and since unity cannot be divided, nor can the sum of diversity ever exceed unity, it therefore becomes obvious that what we call diversity is not a division of unity, but a division within unity, and that there can be never any other number than one, and that number one itself cannot substantially even be a number, because it is always a total idea. Yet this total idea cannot be shaken, cannot be disrupted, cannot be weakened in the consciousness of man. Consequently, the only possibility of the generation of number 
is by a segmentation within the concept of unity. Pythagoras then began to examine the concept of the duad, the two, or the numeration of division. And to him, the duad, or the two, was the archetypal form of division. And as this archetypal form of division, could have no subsistence in itself, could exist only by virtue of the parental monad, and its powers, therefore, were always inferior to those of its own generating source. The duad could not divide the monad, and therefore two totalities could not come into existence. Two can never, therefore, be the double of the one. This attacks the basic concept that we have in theology of anthropomorphism, in which we oppose a principle of good and evil, and cause these to battle through the ages of, and through the millennia of time for supremacy over the world. Pythagoras, Pythagoras said, the deity is the one to which there can be no essential two. Therefore, what is the two? And Pythagoras, following perhaps some of his Brahmin masters at Elora or Elephanta, declared the two to be the root of illusion. And whenever the number was referred to in the school, the master or the disciple using the word spat upon the ground to indicate his rejection of the original concept involved. Two is a very interesting and important problem, but we have to approach it somewhat carefully because we must first of all try to understand with Pythagoras how the concept of the monad can produce within itself the concept of the duad. It does so by recognizing the possibility of unity consisting of any conceivable or inconceivable number of parts. And these parts, regardless of their number, are summarized by the concept of part, or the concept of a partial existence all of which pertains to the number two. Two, consequently, represents any possible conceivable appearance of disunity which may exist in space. It means, for instance, that when we see two ones side by side and we unite them by holding them together, and we call them two. The name two pertains to our illusional or materialistic lack of internal understanding. Because a two composed of parts brought together is not a two, but a monad. It is one. So what is two? as we are holding two objects in our hands. Two is one in the term of halves. Thus, no matter the number of parts involved, uh, the triad, or the three, is one in the term of thirds. The tetrad, or the four, is one in terms of fourths. Because the moment we say four, we give the number of parts. The moment we say tetrad, we give the name for the unity of those parts. Therefore, all numerations are names for unity 
when conceived of as consisting of parts. The consciousness of this leads then to the recollection or the recognition of the restoration of unity through the reintegration of their parts. All division lies in the acceptance of the classification of number. All unity in the acceptance of the classification of numeration. Thus, if we are advancing politically, sociologically, culturally, if we are trying to overcome religious prejudices or racial prejudices or cultural intervals, we are constantly seeking to reestablish unity. And this unity is the internal comprehension of the idea behind the concept of separation. Unless the idea is there and active, we are unaware of the fact that all divided parts, when brought together, create unity and that unities of various sizes, numbers, and orders, by their further gatherings and minglings, create still greater unities. And these unities, in turn, unite to form more magnificent unities, and so finally all converge in total unity. Thus the universe is an ascending order of unities. <coughs> composed of lesser parts and themselves the lesser parts of greater unities. All unities, therefore, regarded or contemplated from levels below themselves have one nature or appearance and when conceived from levels above themselves have another nature or appearance. A unity when conceived from a level below itself, appears to be an aggregate of separate parts. When seen from a level above itself, it is a unity composed of separate parts. The superior always conceives the unity, or discovers it, or experiences it, whereas the inferior sees the parts but is unable to conceive the unity. Thus, if we look upon twelve from below, we see twelve separate parts. If we look at twelve from a superior position, we see unity manifesting through the numeral twelve. This is a matter of perspective, and here we open another vast pageant of speculation. Man looking upward to the aggregates of unities above himself, calls them gods. And these gods in turn, looking toward the unity which transcends themselves, calls this of sovereign unity being, or the supreme and one God, above all division. The universe then, like the original cell of the human body, it is never in itself divided by nature or substance. But as cell multiplication takes place within the first fecundated cell, and so finally the entire body develops within the original cell and never departs from it, so surely the infinite diversity of creation occurs within the original cell, which is unity, which is being, which is the indivisible nature of deity itself. Thus we have now the recognition uh, that all division consists of a hypothetical division within eternal and real unity, and that division exists only in the consciousness of creatures on a lower level than the phenomena involved. 
For that which stands above diversity annihilates it. That which stands below diversity may be intellectually or spiritually annihilated by the sense of diversity, and therefore be unaware of the eternal unity. No unity or the monad, being in itself an indivisible, eternal, unconditioned, unlimited existence, properly signified by the sphere, the totality of all parts, all things being equidistant from the eternal central zone of consciousness. We have to recognize that deity is also susceptible of another meaning or another interpretation. For if God is all is one or eternity, God is also one in the sense of the first, the superior, the most magnificent, that which excels all other things, and by its excellence, or by its primordial place, it gives us another concept of unity. Therefore, we may worship God with equal propriety, either as the All or the One. Now, in the nature of the One, what is different from the nature of totality? The nature of totality is complete inclusiveness. The nature of one represents a more or less complete exclusiveness. The one is the superior. It is the greatest. It is the first. Therefore, it represents not only total being, but the supreme excellence of a being. And in the concept of the human mind, there is this almost inevitable alternation between conceiving the supreme being as all or one. As one, as the first, as the primordial, it may properly be placed in the center of the circle or the hypothetical sphere of existence in the form of a dot. And we create a very simple, universal, mathematical symbol, often applied by primitive people to the sun, and still so used in astronomical symbolism, namely a dot in a circle. This dot in the circle tell, tells us one in all, and also by reverse, all in one. The, the dot tells us that the inconceivable, immeasurable, incalculable totality of being does not itself change, but man, in his effort to conceive of this, and being unable to assume total consciousness, attempts to define the all by bestowing upon it certain singular attributes by which it achieves uniqueness of concept. And this uniqueness of concept is the first departure of man into the realm of relative thinking. When we think of God as unique, we think of God as set apart from all things. If we think of God as unit, we think of God as all things, the total and entire substance of all parts. Thus, in the concept of uniqueness, we strangely transform or deform the concept of unity and we come gradually to the recognition of God no longer as being, but as a being. 
no longer as principle, but as a principle. No longer as consciousness, but as a consciousness. And this by itself is a division, a reduction, by which totality is destroyed. And we have a being, or a, tota a total unit established, surrounded by an abyss, of a non-identical nature. The moment we conceive of a superior or unique being, we create this concept by differentiating it from all other things. And in so doing, we create polarity. And we have a being and not being. Not being being, of course, by nature and substance, the dark background or the uh, background of the concept of a being which we have created within ourselves. Thus, the moment we create a God or a God concept, we bring inevitably into existence the not God concept. And the most primary concept that we have of this is the hypothetical division of spirit and matter. Thus, duality, or the two, represented to the Pythagoreans spirit and matter, light and darkness, male and female, life and death, representing all polarized existence the positive pole of these existences being conceived as a reality, and the negative pole as a shadow or non-substance deprived of that which is the essential nature of substance. Some ancient theologists and mythologists conceived that originally the universe was an infinite expanse of being, and that gradually this infinite expanse retired, or, so to say, restricted itself toward its own center, creating an effulgent spiritual existence, and leaving the area from which it had retired deprived of its own nature, leaving, therefore, darkness behind it, or the not-self in the great space left by the withdrawal of being to form a being, or a center of consciousness, or consciousness as a self-consciousness in space. If then we have self-consciousness, we must also have an interval of some nature, for self can only be unique because it is separate from or different from other selves. And man, in his gradual development of his innate egoism, has come to this curious psychological situation in which uniqueness is the experience within each psychic entity, and each individual feels strangely that he is unique. <laughs> that the divine or essential spark within himself is a separate and distinct spark with a separate and distinct destiny. And upon this concept, the whole conception of Western philosophy and Western theology has been built. Because it is this concept which makes this unique self capable of separation in quality from being therefore capable of ignorance, capable of violation of the law of being, therefore capable of sin and crime. And because it has a separate existence, and because no separate existence is eternal, the complex of selfhood brings with it the inevitable fear of death. Because death is inescapable, where a condition of uniqueness or a separateness of one thing from another exists. 
or uniqueness to be sustained must imply a constant conflict between itself and the not-self which surrounds it. And this conflict ends finally in the exhaustion of selfhood because the spark of self in each creature is infinitely outnumbered by the incalculable area of not-self. And the self is but a spark in an infinite expanse of space which is forever closing in upon that sense of selfhood. Thus the self cannot have a victory over totality, but must finally be exhausted in its psychological conflict with totality and be returned again to the state of totality. Just as all buildings built by man upon the earth will ultimately rot back into the earth from which they came, just as all worlds and planets must ultimately return to the space from which they came, all conditioned beings by being conditioned are mortal and must therefore return to an unconditioned state which to our unenlightened intellect means extinction. This conditioned space, then, now becomes the hypothetical, hypothetical Pythagorean duad. It is the one in the term of halves. And wherever we have this one in the term of halves, the positive pole assumes the dynamic position, becoming the agent. The negative pole assumes the static position and becomes the patient. Therefore, agent and patient are in contrast to each other through all eternity. The agent and patient, in this case, may be regarded as spirit and matter, or they may be regarded as intellect and form. But by whatever nature we wish to recognize them, the Pythagoreans insisted that the acceptance of the concept of duality and the projection of categories based upon duality and the unfoldment of syllogisms based upon duality, all of these resulted in the mind gradually descending into a state of illusion. Inasmuch as the existence of selfhood itself is a primary illusion. And from this one basic illusion, all others naturally follow. This is essentially the teaching of Buddha, who was convinced that the acceptance of the illusion of personal divinity or personal self either must ultimately lead to the complete corruption of the internal consciousness of man. Now, if we have the monad as all consciousness, then the diversity, the duad, gives us self-consciousness and unconsciousness. Self-consciousness is the term that we naturally bestow upon our own field of conscious awareness. Unconsciousness is the mysterious sea in which each one of us tries to swim. For unconsciousness is nothing more nor less than the consciousness of all things except ourselves, which we, not being able to know, appreciate, or understand, must naturally regard as mysterious, unknowable, vague, dark, beyond comprehension. Thus, in psychology, we approach the same essential problem. When the psychologist refers to the unconscious, it is not immediately evident, either to himself or anyone else, whether he refers to that which is unconscious in space or that of which he is unconscious, but which may, in its own nature, be superlatively conscious. Thus, we also have another important <coughs> fragment from the Pythagorean logic on these matters. For we know 
that there is nothing more mysterious to any individual than the thoughts of his neighbor. Not one of us knows with certainty what anyone else thinks or believes. So we have a little spark of light which we call our own thinking, uh, which is constantly surrounded by a strange darkness which is the thinking of every other person. And this thinking of every other person, when gathered together, as far as our experience is concerned, is no thinking, because we cannot share in it. We cannot participate in it. It has no mental or visual imaging power within ourselves. We can see other persons, and we can assume that they are thinking. But if we could not see them, and they were of a substance different from ourselves, we would not even assume that they were thinking or that they even had a mental existence. Therefore, all bodies which surround us, which are not visible to us, or are by magnitude or multitude so remote as to be beyond comprehension, are by ourselves assumed to be mindless because we are unable to conceive of their intellectual activity. The illusion rests then in this very simple point, namely that to each person, every other person is unreal. It means then that in this concept there can be no reality. For if we are real to ourselves, we are part of everyone else's unreality. And this concept must lead us to the inevitable conclusion that we are actually living not in a world in which we as a self can be in any way unique, but that this uniqueness is a delusion of our own, and that every other living thing is equally unique. And the totality of this uniqueness is unity, which is substantially indivisible anyway. The uniqueness is only our own point of view, uh, which is obviously stupid when we consider it for any extended length of time. Thus uniqueness is only our own egotistic assumption. And when all the rest of the world has the same attitude, then everyone is unique to himself and non-existent to everyone else. Here we have the center also of another kind of universe, the universe of illusion in which its center also is everywhere and its circumference nowhere. It is exactly the reverse of the great circumference of reality. The duad, by nature then, representing a certain inharmonious uh, maladjustment of understanding or lack of understanding, was, according to the Pythagoreans, the first apperceptible number. The monad was really too sacred to be a number, because the moment you put the number one on it, you created uniqueness and destroyed it. Therefore, neither the one nor the monad should be considered as numbers. They should be considered as principles abiding forever in eternity. Two, as diversity, is thus the first of the true numbers, because diversity is the first aspect of being of which man is aware, and of which he is able to have a certain rational cognition. And of this, then, Pythagoras said, the monad is intellect, the duality is science, the triad 
is opinion, and the tetrad is sense. And we have this descent of power. Now the number three was very important in the Pythagorean thinking because it relates also to an instinct which is experienced within the mystery of numeration itself. Uh, to the Pythagorean, the triad was the symbol of equilibrium in space. Inasmuch as the triad consists of three monads and two intervals. In other words, if you make three little dots in a row, you have three dots, and the spaces between them constitute two intervals, one on each side of the center dot, between it and the next dot. <laughs> Thus, says Pythagoras also, we must never lose sight of the significance of interval. And we say that interval is important because it represents an intangible, non-existing thing which can at the same time exercise a moral force. In other words, interval is something that comes into being as the result of objects. And this interval becomes indispensable to the estimation of the objects themselves. Thus, interval equals instruction. And by interval, or by the concept of interval, conditioned existence is capable of estimating realities. And these realities are the little dots, the three dots, which in their own natures are inscrutable, but which may be estimated by interval and known most by the spaces between them, rather than by their own natures. Why is this true? The reason this is true is because man, conceiving any order or group of things as monads, is utterly incapable of defining them. He may create a name for them, but this name does not mean that he apprehends their nature. Supposing we have three monads along in a row, we call one cat, the second dog, and the third mouse. Here are three monads, three beings, and the person does not live who can give an adequate definition of any one of them. We know a great deal, but we do not know what a cat is. Its essential nature is as inscrutable as the nature of the universe. And perhaps we were particularly wise in the selection of a cat, which is a monument to inscrutability in the majority of instances. People do not have cats for pets. Cats have people for pets. <laughs> No one knows what a dog is. No one knows what a mouse is. No one knows what an oak tree is. No one knows why it is an oak tree, for it is only a name which we have given to it. And when we are asked what it is, we give this name and glibly assume that we have said something. When all we have done is had a mild outburst of language. <laughs> The, fa the fact of any of these creatures is rooted in ground so deep and mysterious that the wisest man in the world has never penetrated it. Therefore, these three creatures sitting along in a row with a short interval between them remain inscrutable until they begin to move in the interval. We learn a certain something about what a cat is when it starts to chase the mouse. 
we know something of the nature of all these creatures by their reactions upon each other. And these reactions take place not in themselves, but in the spaces between themselves, qualitatively. Place anything in its environment, therefore, and permit it to function in a space equation, and then place at the boundaries of that equation other beings, things, or monads. And we will find that if one of these monads is a cup of milk, the cat will approach it. If one of these monads is a piece of cheese, the mouse will approach it. And we observe through these reactions of things upon each other what the attributes of these various creatures are. We place ourselves in an environmental relation to any group of monads, observe the activities of these monads, their functions or their purposes, either their motions or their immutabilities, and conceiving of these things over periods of time in which such factors as growth, seasons, motions, generation, and reproduction occur. We thus gradually come to an environmental, circumstantial acquaintance with creatures which in themselves are unknowable, but are to be determined or discovered or to be analyzed only by their relationships with other things. These relationships, therefore, constitute the Pythagorean concept of interval, because in these intervals, where reactions operate upon reactions and actions upon actions, we are able to perceive certain inherent qualities of bodies which cannot be discerned while these bodies are static and can only be known when they enter into a state of motion. And motion is movement within space interval. And this movement is a gradual signature by which each thing writes a kind of name for itself by what it does. In the same problem with human experience, man himself, through intervals, attempts association with other human beings, becoming thus gradually aware of their existences, not by what they are, but by what they do. Therefore, we cannot know the man who, closing the doors of his house, locks himself in and stays there indefinitely. The only thing we can then know about him relates to this action, which in turn may lead to certain conclusions. These conclusions might be wrong if we were able to know and approach this person. So whatever we do becomes the key to the presentation of ourselves to any other creature or any other being in the universe. By the similar token, the nature of deity in substance is unknowable. But when deity enters a state of motion and moves within the interval which is enclosed by its own substance and nature. Deity, by internal motion, causes the emergence from itself of what the Pythagoreans called the tetractus, the pyramid of dots, consisting of ten monads arranged in four rows, which we will discuss in another lecture. But the internal motion of deity results in the generation of existence. This gives us another important definition. If an individual upon a plane of abstraction, equivalent or nearly equivalent to his concept of that upon which deity abides, was to have 
an internal motion. What would we consider the nature of that motion to be? Conceiving that as yet there is no world form such as we know it, no world mind such as we apperceive it. There is therefore only the initial or primal motion of being within itself. What could such a motion be? And the ancients could conceive of only one thing, and that is motion of consciousness within itself. This motion would therefore be an internal motion of consciousness. And the Greeks and the Orphics and the Pythagoreans generally assumed that creation was the result of an internal motion of the divine consciousness. If such is the case, how would we describe such a process on the level of our own functioning? We would therefore be required to assume that this creative motion of consciousness would correspond to our concept of meditation, realization, concentration, or one of those internal disciplines by which consciousness is caused to move within ourselves. This led the Greeks to assume uh, that creation was therefore an internal experience in the divine consciousness, not an external one, because to the divine consciousness being totality there can be no external. The only possible motion of eternity is within itself. The Brahmins of India have this same idea when in their explanation of the circumference of the body of God, they say that deity extends to the outer boundaries of absolute space and three inches beyond. In other <laughs> words, there is a complete totality. As being is all there is, infinite in power and duration and infinite in extent. There can be no externalization of its nature. The only direction it can move is in, or move within. Plato and many of the other Greek philosophers assume that all motion of universal consciousness is from circumference to center. And therefore, that deity in contemplation or eternal being in assuming the illusion of division within itself moved toward its own center and in so doing created the duality, the dot and the circle. And that this duality then represented a polarized experience of consciousness within total being. Now the Pythagoreans ask a very pertinent question. In this process of polarization, did being lose awareness of its own nature? In other words, was totality captured within its own basic diversity? Did the eternal concept of unity fail in space as it has failed in man, so that man is not capable of experiencing unity except by theoretical affirmation? That is, unless he has undertaken a very long and cathartic discipline under one of the great systems of mystical religion. Normally, he cannot experience accept or experience identity. Therefore, is the primary duality of being a condition which annihilates the unity of basic consciousness itself? Now then comes the greater question which Pythagoras estimated with considerable skill, namely whether totality possessed a consciousness in any way re relative to ours, 
or whether what we call consciousness itself arose from the duad or from duality, and whether the whole concept of consciousness is related to the idea of unit, one, and therefore that consciousness did not exist until illusion set in, and that total being has a total awareness which is beyond the concept of consciousness. This we cannot follow, nor could Pythagoras, other than to suggest the possibility, the grave probability, that self-knowing is reserved to those creatures in which the polarity of division has already occurred. Because self-knowing is obviously in itself a fallacy. Self-knowing being the recognition of the fact of a separate selfness can only exist in conditioned beings. This led the Eastern Buddhists to refrain from any effort to define the state of the Mahaparanavanic consciousness. In other words, the consciousness of the being which is identical with reality. Whether this is a conscious being, a universally aware being, or whether it is a totally submerged existence, no one has ever been able to dogmatically affirm. But we have the Pythagorean concept that duality, being the first of the numbers, must therefore imply that the state of consciousness rising from duality is the first of the illusions, and that from this illusion all others must naturally suspend. In the study of the natural mathematics of the universe, the Pythagoreans began to experience the struggle which nature is perpetually maintaining to preserve equilibrium. <coughs> In other words, that which is unbalanced must be restored, for nature is forever gravitating against excess. Now why does nature gravitate against excess? Because ex excess is the tipping of the poles of polarity. And the moment that there, these poles are tipped, every force in the universe rushes toward the maintenance of equilibrium or the restoration of it. Unbalance, therefore, leads to motion. And wherever there is motion, there is some form of unbalance in nature. It is the problem of the sphere resting on the surface. If the surface is absolutely level, the sphere will stand still. But if the surface is not level, the sphere will begin to roll toward the lower part or the depressed part of the surface. Thus motion arises from imbalance or from the loss of even surfaces. And in the universe, that which is or becomes unbalanced, immediately moves into the sphere or concept of dynamic. Thus all dynamic must have a certain asymmetry. And we know in art that the dynamic symmetry of the great masters as Leonardo and Michelangelo, both of whom were profoundly acquainted with the Pythagorean doctrine, that the dynamic of these artists is always achieved by imbalance. Uh, we put a dot in the center, it is not interesting. If we put the face in a portrait in the center of the canvas, it is not interesting. We must place it off center. We must create imbalance to call attention or to cause the sensory reaction of the observer to move. We move the individual 
by imbalance. Thus we also move him by pain. We move him by war. We move him by crime. But we seldom ever move him by peace. We seldom have ever moved him by virtue. Because things which are right and in their places are not dynamic. And it is much easier to get an individual to crusade against an evil than it is to get him to maintain a virtue. Because imbalance creates a dynamic reaction within man. The dynamic of the universe is therefore caused by imbalance. But the universe realizes that all unbalanced forces, as says the Zohar, must perish in the void. All unbalance ultimately leads to destruction, unless nature can restore equilibrium. So that what nature is attempting to do is to restore equilibrium. And equilibrium is in some way, therefore, directly related to unity. And imbalance is directly related to duality. Now, assuming that we achieve unity, we observe immediately that we move from an active to a passive state. Now, by active to passive, we mean from objective to subjective in many cases. Or we mean a departure from motion uh, to that which is the suspension of motion. Now, which is the more dynamic, motion or the suspension of motion? Pythagoras answered, which is the most difficult to acquire? Anyone can move. But how many individuals can make a magnificent job of standing still? And individuals becoming internally immovable find this state infinitely more difficult to sustain than any state of motion. They are, however, penalized by others for persons not realizing the possibility of a dynamic suspension of motion, associate motion with life and immovability with death, and conceive that that which does not move is dead. Pythagoras says, no, because that which is the root of all things cannot move. That is being itself. Because to move, a thing must pass from where it is to where it is not. And being is always everywhere. Therefore, there is no place for it to go. The dynamic principle, then, of the suspension of motion is never to be confused with the absence of motion. The suspension of motion is a positive state of restraint or the poising of a thing perpetually upon its point. In other words, it relates to the sphere. The absence of motion is that which is represented by the exhaustion of vitality at the circumference of the area of its own field of energy. The exhaustion of vitality comes as the result of motion rather than the result of the suspension of motion. Motion, therefore, leads to negative exhaustion. Suspension of motion is neither positive nor negative, but partakes of the nature of being itself. Now, the Pythagoreans believe, therefore, that in the numeration or the uh, numeral three, the triad, that there was imposed or interposed between the polarities of the duad a third point, which was the point of equilibrium. 
The Pythagoreans then declared that contrary to our practical or popular practice of placing good and bad on the pans at the two ends of a pair of scales, weighing the good against the evil, and observing that to be good in which the side of the scale containing good was the heaviest. The Pythagorean says that these two, the weighing of good and evil, were the weighing of two illusional polarities, one against the other. And that the only point of reality in such a point matter was the middle of the beam. Therefore, they said, of polarities, Ill or evil is at both ends, and good at the center only. Therefore, the point of good is not opposed to evil, but is in equilibrium between two forms of excess, both evil. Now, a practical experience of that can be considered in the problem of the individual with his money. Money is not evil, but the use of it may cause it to become a great cause of danger. The individual who hoards his money is called a miser. This is one extreme. The individual who wastes his money is called a spendthrift. This is the other extreme. These are the two ends of the balance, both unbalanced. But the individual who moderately uses his means for that which is of the greater good is at the center, the point of equilibrium. Therefore, in possession, use is the point of equilibrium, and abuse, either by excess or by privation, these are the two polarities, and they are both wrong. This is the reason for the concept of the golden mean, represented in symbolism by the golden cut of Aristotle, and also by the famous Socratic axiom, in all things, not too much. Thus, equilibrium comes as a balance between the aggression of polarities. In the creative triad of things, we have also the problem in the human soul of what is going to impose itself between the aggressive triad which is created in man's nature. This aggressive triad can be conceived of as existing in all parts of his constitution. And we may say that for one of these triad polarities, we can say the mind and the emotions. These two are polarized. And if either one of them is weighed against the other or enters into competition with the other or goes into conflict with the other or seeks to overpower the other or take upon itself the prerogatives of the other, there is, a, there is confusion, discord, imbalance, and destruction. So the Pythagoreans believed that there was a principle which was representing, or which did represent, the primordial monad that descended and took its place on the level of number and placed itself between the poles of the two and created equilibrium. And the name which they gave to this central uh, monad was the beautiful. Now the beautiful was to them the symbol of the healing of polarity. It became art as a great moderator of the excesses of life. Thus we have the art of living. We have the fine arts. But we have beauty which is always seeking order and is seeking to impose its own archetype upon all excess and bring it back into moderation. Beauty, therefore, becomes to the Greeks the symbol of the universal redeemer. 
because beauty is an experience of equilibrium, even in the absence of the equilibrium itself. The artist lives in a world in which he conceives and creates or releases beauty which he intuitively feels. And in the process of doing this, he is like the true artist who becomes the handmaiden of nature. And in the terms of the medieval alchemist, there is the great statement, art perfects nature. If an artist, therefore, goes out on the side of a hill to paint, and he sees several trees blowing against the sky, his eye will tell him that there are too many trees for his purpose. So when he paints the picture, he will leave out unnecessary trees, although they are there, and reduce his picture to the law and order which he regards as proper. In the same way, the artist in man gradually proceeds to put in order all the invisible, tangible, or recognizable excesses or imbalances of nature around him. In his own creativity, in his own internal life, therefore, the artist censors nature and attempts to assert a vision of unity, a vision of order, upon the phenomenal indications of disorder that may appear around him. The artist does this by releasing a creativity within himself and flowing out across the two intervals which divide the end points or dots from the center one in the little row of three dots. The beautiful then becomes the end, the symbol of equilibrium, polarity, balanced, the restoration of order, and by that, the restoration also of the divine order and of the golden age, as the Greeks called it. This principle of the beautiful likewise gives rise out of mathematical formula to the messianic concept. For the second person of the creative triad, the Redeemer, the link between the divine and the mortal, uh, the Son of Man and the Son of God, this heroic creature, this Savior, which stands between in the middle distance and is crucified between the two thieves of polarized excess, represents in each instance the ordinating, integrating power of beauty. Not beauty merely of external things, but the pure beauty, which is part of the inner concept or consciousness of equilibrium. For equilibrium <coughs> represents beauty, and beauty is actually the suspension of excess in all things, and the restoration of immovable principles which have been obscured by the motion of generated forms. This is also according to the concept of the Orphics. The Pythagoreans then completed their great picture of the basic pattern of number and numeration by the establishment of the Tetrad or the great pattern of the numeration four. And the numeration four was to them the primary symbol of justice, because four is the first number to be composed of even and natural parts. <laughs> it is the first number equally divisible because the, they did not regard the two as a n number of this kind, since division of it could result only in the primordial one, which is not possible in the universe. Therefore, four, the product of the addition of two even numbers, was to them the symbol of order, of justice, 
and of the regaining or reestablishing of balance in nature. Also, the tetrahedron, or the four-faced symmetrical solid, is the least geometric form which can enclose an area. Therefore, this number four was also the proper symbol of the mundane world, which is the peculiar revealer of law. For just as surely as things enter into generation and become involved in the mystery of matter, so surely they come under the direct and inevitable jurisdiction of universal law. And the physical universe as we see it is the amphitheater of law, in which all things, by the process of existence, become inevitably and instinctively aware of law, and learn either to abide by it or suffer its consequences. Therefore, the material sphere is a lawful state of souls, in which all things come to learn obedience, and come to learn uh, to accept the inevitability and the immutability of the sovereign principles from which they are suspended. Thus this world, this material world, is the symbol of the administrative power of deity. And deity itself, extending from the mysterious and hypothetical one which is the intellect of the world through the mystery of diversity which is the intellectual extension of the intellect into the sphere of mind from there to the equilibrium or the generation of the power of soul for soul is the geometric pattern of the beautiful and finally into form, into the four-square world of matter, composed of the four elements known to the ancients, the great hollow square, which is the amphitheater of existence, the ball court of the ancient Aztec Indians, where they played the game of life upon the square of the world. These four numbers, then, by their addition, the four to the three to the two to the one, equal the number ten, which in itself is the exhaustion of all numbers and the restoration of the monad. We will later see how these numbers are extended through the pentad and on uh, to the decade or the end of the numerical system. But for our present purposes, we are concerned primarily with the recognition of this descent of principles called numerations, which are each one of them formulas for the application of the concept of the numeral to the phenomenal sphere of existence, so that out of the entire concept comes an inevitable philosophy of life a philosophy of life in one of the purest symbolical forms that we know, because it is in a form so simple, so direct, and so inevitable that it is almost impossible to confuse it with theological abstractions. It becomes an obvious, clear-cut concept of the descent of principles in their own spheres and in their own orders and in their own ways moving victoriously from unity in reality to diversity in appearance or illusion. Now assuming that we gathered up totally all of the various parts of the universe that have come into being and manifestation since the dawn or the beginning or the first spark was seen in space, and we total all of these, what would their relation be to the primary consciousness which engendered them? We say that populations are increasing. That there are more folks on earth than there used to be. And that there may be a time in which the earth will be so crowded 
that it will almost be essential that nature itself step in and limit propagation, as it has done on numerous occasions in lesser theaters which we have analyzed. The answer to this question lies in the indisputable fact that the growth and unfoldment of things and their numerical increase, either in magnitude or in multitude, can have no effect upon totality, inasmuch as nothing can outgrow totality. And no two things, regardless of how vast they may be, can individually ever exceed one half of totality, or four things can ever exceed in each one fourth of totality. It is therefore not possible for one part of totality to grow so great that it will crowd out another part, nor is it possible for the situation to finally become so incredible that it is necessary to revise the boundaries of totality itself. Such things cannot be. Why? Because of archetype. Archetype being the image or design in the divine mind. Nor can God nor man think beyond itself. The divine mind can contain no concept superior to its own totality. Therefore, it can engender nothing that can exceed itself. And as all things by their growth are, as the Bible says, filling up their numbers. And you will find the same quotation used in one of the Shakespeare plays. It is therefore inevitable that all things can fill only the patterns by which their own life ways are uh, promised or perfected. What then occurs when things seem to exceed themselves? And therefore it would appear that the next step that they make would inevitably break through the pattern and result in what Pythagoras termed a superabundant number. The moment things increase beyond a certain point they do not outgrow themselves. They grow into the archetypal unity which is next superior to them. Thus, two things growing to become greater than they are unite to form one thing which already exists archetypally as the next inevitable step of themselves. Things are growing themselves, therefore, do not outgrow their creator, but outgrow a level of creation and are immediately integrated in a larger unity. That is, life is not a continuous uh, expression or unfoldment of separate parts. There can never be a superabundance of numbers. If a tree, for example, could keep on growing on and on and on like Jack's proverbial beanstalk, it is conceivable that one tree might sometime fill all space like the graceful tree of the ancient Nordic religious rites. But this does not happen because growth in itself is a motion toward unity and not toward the infinite extension of an individual number throughout eternity. Things, therefore, grow together, and all growth is a union of parts and the reestablishment of unities. When things outgrow themselves, they have merely fulfilled their part of something else. And superabundance is merely, therefore, the projection of a thing towards the next state of itself, which is already archetypally established. 
And as things by their advancement become more and more refined and less and less in number, evolution ends gradually in the resolving of numbers. In other words, if a creature beginning at a state of multiplicity at the base of the pyramid of evolution grows, Supposing we will say that he grows from a hundred roots which he has planted in faculties, powers, dimensions, propensities, and other uh, phases of his own being. As he ascends, these hundred parts do not continue to grow as a hundred trees of life within him. The first step upward that he takes, the hundred become ninety. The next step, the 90 becomes 80. And instead of growing to superabundance, he grows to unity and reestablishes the identical, identical numerational identity with which he started. Thus growth is the gradual reduction of number because by means of it, numbers die in numeration again. And each step of number means a return of some part of the number concept into its numerical overtone or archetype. So the creature who began with many ends with one. The race that begins as an infinite number of individuals ends as one being. Growth, therefore, cannot result in an infinite multiplication of races until space is full of them. Because growth gradually ascends like a pyramid to an apex, and all growing things decrease in multitude of parts and magnitude of size until the concept of totality is reestablished as a fact of being and not as a continued individual existence. The end of things, therefore, is their re-identification with total being. And the end of growth is not that God will produce competitor gods who are going to try to wrest heaven from him as Saturn sought to take the throne of Uranus. Rather, the return toward consciousness is the re-identification of principles over division or the restoration of the unity of divided parts. So as growth may produce the appearance of diversity, growth also symbolizes maturing or unfolding of consciousness. And all growth is to the expansion of form and all consciousness is toward the identity of life. And as the battle between form and consciousness is always ultimately won by consciousness, identity always is victorious, and the divided parts return to form the basic unity from which they were originally engendered. Thus in the Pythagorean concept, what we call evolution is total being which has been infinitely fragmented within itself but remains archetypally an absolute unity gradually restores on the plane of phenomena the fact of this unity. But as it proceeds in this direction it runs against the inevitable fact that the primordial unity was not upon this plane. And therefore, as the processes of unification advance, the beings themselves retire to these other planes sequentially until unity is ultimately factually achieved on the plane where the beginning was made, because it is only on that plane that absolute unity can be experienced. This is all set forth and revealed through the pattern of numbers and uh, opens to us a very large vista. I think, however, that perhaps the most important lesson 
to be gained from the basic concept is that the individual should realize that manyness, in whatever form it exists, is an appearance. To accept it is to be deceived by it. And through this deceit, to permit the continuance of the consciousness of separateness within the soul, for whatever we perceive externally and accept through the perceptive power, uh, we receive as a doctrine in the psychic nature. Therefore, by the constant reaffirmation of separateness, we indoctrinate ourselves with our own deceit. Whereas, if we are as wise as the Pythagoreans were, we shall attempt, even with limited faculties and powers, to discover and identify unities and to think of all groupings and accumulations of powers, forces, circumstances, nations, races, individuals, as parts of new unities forming to continue the process of revealing primordial identity. If we can therefore conceive of all parts as indispensable to the totality, if we can understand in the Pythagorean manner why the powers of the universe are mindful of each sparrow's fall, we, they would then realize that the universe cannot be complete without that sparrow. For totality can never be established while there is a deficiency in any part of it. This incidentally also implies that in totality there can never be less than there was in the beginning. Therefore, that no form of essential life can cease. No order of life can fail. No body of living things can be utterly annihilated. For at the end, the number of the parts must be equal to the number of parts that primordially existed in the archetypal diffusion. And while this number is infinite, the great power of unity lies in its totality. And in the concept of totality, there can be no space for imperfection, limitation, or the frustration of parts. All things, whether they know it or not, whether they understand or not, whether they believe or not, are inevitably moving into these vast totality patterns. There are no lost souls, no hopeless state, no, da no damned spirits. There can only be ultimately a totality reestablished by the return of all the parts to their original cause. And at that time, there cannot one be missing. Thus growth is a continual and eternal restatement of monads or of numerations over numbers. And every time we reach a hand out and take the hand of a friend, we have made a symbol of a unity. We have brought together two divided parts. And as long as we remain true to this, we shall have increased or restated the principle of unity in all things. Therefore, by unity, we forever reveal truth. By diversity, we forever reveal error. And any act that is performed toward the establishment of unity is sacred. And any act which is performed for the purpose of division is profane. For it is the will of the infinite that all things shall be one, and being one shall restore the infinite to the fullness and completeness of itself. And when all divided parts within unity are reestablished, unity is restored to equilibrium, time and eternity cease, and that which is the absolute suspension of being, total and complete eternity and inevitability, is reestablished. 
and the infinite remains itself in the total recognition of its own reality. This in substance is the Pythagorean theory of creation and the principle behind the concept of numeration and number. And we will proceed with this to the next step of our study uh, a week from this evening.